blood of elves. Chapter 1 Aye, minstrel, said Mama Lantieri, striding into the room without knocking, the scents of hyacinths, sweat, beer and smoked bacon wafting before her. You've got a guest. Ain't a noble gentleman? Dandelion smoothed his hair and sat up in the enormous carved armchair. The two girls sitting on his lap quickly jumped up, covering their charms and pulling down their disordered clothes. The modesty of harlots, thought the poet, was not at all a bad title for a ballad. He got to his feet, fastened his belt and pulled on his doublet, all the while looking at the nobleman standing at the threshold. Indeed, he remarked. You know how to find me anywhere, though you rarely pick an opportune moment. You're lucky I'd not yet decided which of these two beauties I prefer. And at your prices, Lantieri, I cannot afford them both. Mama Lantieri smiled in sympathy and clapped her hands. Both girls, a fair-skinned, freckled islander and a dark-haired half-elf, swiftly left the room. The man at the door removed his cloak and handed it to Mama, along with a small but well-filled money-bag. Forgive me, master he said, approaching the table and making himself comfortable. I know this is not a good time to disturb you, but you disappeared out from beneath the oak so quickly. I did not catch you on the high road as I had intended, and did not immediately come across your tracks in this little town. I'll not take much of your time, believe me. They always say that, and it's always a lie, the bard interrupted. Leave us alone, Lantieri, and see to it we're not disturbed. I'm listening, sir. The man scrutinized him. He had dark, damp, almost tearful eyes, a pointed nose and ugly, narrow lips. I'll come to the point without wasting your time, he declared, waiting for the door to close behind Mama. Your ballads interest me, Master. To be more specific, certain characters of which you sang interest me. I am concerned with the true fate of your ballad's heroes. If I am not mistaken, the true destinies of real people inspired the beautiful work I heard beneath the oak tree. I have in mind little Cyrilla of Sintra, Queen Calanthe's granddaughter. Dandelion gazed at the ceiling, drumming his fingers on the table. Honoured sir, he said dryly, you are interested in strange matters. You ask strange questions. Something tells me you are not the person I took you to be. And who did you take me to be, if I may ask? I'm not sure you may. It depends if you are about to convey greetings to me from any mutual friends. You should have done so initially, but somehow you have forgotten. I did not forget at all. The man reached into the breast pocket of his sepia-coloured velvet tunic and pulled out a money bag somewhat larger than the one he had handed the procurus, but just as well filled, which clinked as it touched the table. We simply have no mutual friends, Dandelion. But might this purse not suffice to mitigate the lack? And what do you intend to buy with this meagre purse? The troubadour pouted. Mama Lantieri's entire brothel and all the land surrounding it? Let us say that I intend to support the art and an artist, in order to chat with the artist about his work. You love art so much, do you, dear sir? Is it so vital for you to talk to an artist that you press money on him before you've even introduced yourself, and in doing so break the most elementary rules of courtesy? At the beginning of our conversation, the stranger's dark eyes narrowed imperceptibly. My anonymity did not bother you. And now it is starting to. I am not ashamed of my name, said the man, a faint smile appearing on his narrow lips. I am called Riles. You do not know me, Master Dandelion, and that is no surprise. You are too famous and well-known to know all of your admirers. Yet everyone who admires your talents feels he knows you, knows you so well that a certain degree of familiarity is permissible. This applies to me, too. I know it is a misconception, so please, graciously forgive me. I graciously forgive you. Then I can count on you agreeing to answer a few questions. No, no, you cannot, interrupted the poet, putting on airs. Now, if you will graciously forgive me, 
I am not willing to discuss the subjects of my work, its inspiration or its characters, fictitious or otherwise. Uh, to do so would deprive poetry of its poetic veneer and lead to triteness. Is that so? It certainly is. For example, if, having sung the ballad about the miller's merry wife, I were to announce it's really about Zvirka, Miller Loach's wife, and I included an announcement that Zvirka can most easily be bedded every Thursday, because on Thursdays the miller goes to market, it would no longer be poetry. It would be either rhyming couplets or foul slander. I understand. I understand, Ryan said quickly. But perhaps that is a bad example. I am not, after all, interested in anyone's peccadilloes or sins. You will not slander anyone by answering my questions. All I need is one small piece of information. What really happened to Cyrilla, the Queen of Sintra's granddaughter? Many people claim she was killed during the siege of the town. There are even eyewitnesses to support the claim. From your ballad, however, it would appear that the child survived. I am truly interested to know if this is your imagination at work, or the truth. True or false? I'm extremely pleased you're so interested. Dandelion smiled broadly. You may laugh, Master, whatever your name is, but that was precisely what I intended when I composed the ballad. I wished to excite my listeners and arouse their curiosity. True or false? repeated Ryons coldly. If I were to give that away, I would destroy the impact of my work. Goodbye, my friend. You have used up all the time I can spare you, and two of my many inspirations are waiting out there, wondering which of them I will choose. Ryons remained silent for a long while, making no move to leave. He stared at the poet with his unfriendly, moist eyes, and the poet felt a growing unease. A merry din came from the bawdy house's main room, punctuated from time to time by high-pitched feminine giggles. Dandelion turned his head away, pretending to show derisive haughtiness, but, in fact, he was judging the distance to the corner of the room, and the tapestry showing a nymph sprinkling her breasts with water poured from a jug. Dandelion! Ryons finally spoke, slipping his hand back into the pocket of his sepia-coloured tunic. Answer my questions. Please, I have to know the answer. It's incredibly important to me. To you, too, believe me. Because if you answer of your own free will, then... Then what? A hideous grimace crept over Rounce's narrow lips. Then I won't have to force you to speak. Now listen, you scoundrel! Dandelion stood up and pretended to pull a threatening face. I loathe violence and force, but I'm going to call Mama Lantieri in a minute, and she will call a certain Grutzilla, who fulfills the honourable and responsible role of bouncer in this establishment. He is a true artist in his field. He'll kick your ass so hard you'll soar over the town roofs with such magnificence that the few people passing by at this hour will take you for a pegasus. Ryles made an abrupt gesture, and something glistened in his hand. Are you sure? he asked. You'll have time to call her. Dandelion had no intention of checking if he would have time, nor did he intend to wait. Before the stiletto had locked in Ryons's hand, Dandelion had taken a long leap to the corner of the room, dived under the nymph tapestry, kicked open a secret door, and rushed headlong down the winding stairs, nimbly steering himself with the aid of the well-worn banisters. Ryons darted after him, but the poet was sure of himself. He knew the secret passage like the back of his hand, having used it numerous times to flee creditors, jealous husbands, and furious rivals, from whom he had, from time to time, stolen rhymes and tunes. He knew that after the third turning, he would be able to grope for a revolving door, behind which there was a ladder leading down to the cellar. He was sure that his persecutor would be unable to stop in time, would run on, and step on a trapdoor through which he would fall and land in the pigsty. He was equally sure that, bruised, covered in shit, and mauled by the pigs, his persecutor would give up the chase. Dandelion was mistaken, as was usually the case whenever he was too confident. Something flashed a sudden blue behind his back, and the poet felt his limbs grow numb, lifeless and stiff. He couldn't slow down for the revolving door, his legs wouldn't obey him. He yelled and rolled down the stairs, bumping against the walls of the little corridor. The trapdoor opened beneath him with a dry crack, and the troubadour tumbled down to the darkness and stench. Before thumping his head on the dirt floor and losing consciousness, 
he remembered Mama Lantieri saying something about the pigsty being repaired. The pain in his constricted wrists and shoulders, cruelly twisted in their joints, brought him back to his senses. He wanted to scream, but couldn't. It felt as though his mouth had been stuck up with clay. He was kneeling on the dirt floor, with a creaking rope hauling him up by his wrists. He tried to stand, wanting to ease the pressure on his shoulders, but his legs too were tied together. Choking and suffocating, he somehow struggled to his feet, helped considerably by the rope which tugged mercilessly at him. Vryons was standing in front of him, and his evil eyes glinted in the light of a lantern held aloft by an unshaven ruffian who stood over six feet tall. Another ruffian, probably no shorter, stood behind him. Dandelion could hear his breathing and caught a whiff of stale sweat. It was the reeking man who tugged on the rope, looped over a roof beam, and fastened to the poet's wrists. Dandelion's feet tore off the dirt floor. The poet whistled through his nose, unable to do anything more. Enough! Ryans snapped at last. He spoke almost immediately, yet it had seemed an age to Dandelion. The bard's feet touched the ground, but despite his most heartfelt desire, he could not kneel again. The tight, drawn rope was still holding him as taut as a string. Ryans came closer. There was not even a trace of emotion on his face. The damp eyes had not changed their expression in the least. His tone of voice, too, remained calm, quiet, even a little bored. You nasty rhymester, you runt, you scum, you arrogant nobody. You tried to run from me. No one has escaped me yet. We haven't finished our conversation, you clown, you sheep's head. I asked you a question under much pleasanter circumstances than these. Now you are going to answer all my questions, and in far less pleasant circumstances. Am I right? Dandelion nodded eagerly. Only now did Ryan smile and make a sign. The bard squealed helplessly, feeling the rope tighten and his arms twisted backwards, cracking in their joints. You can't talk, Ryan confirmed, still smiling loathsomely. And it hurts doesn't it? For the moment, you should know, I'm having you strung up like this for my own pleasure, just because I love watching people suffer. Go on, just a little higher. Dandelion was wheezing so hard he almost choked. Enough! Ryans finally ordered, then approached the poet and grabbed him by his shirt ruffles. Listen to me, you little cock. I'm going to lift the spell so you can talk. But if you try to raise your charming voice any louder than necessary, you'll be sorry. He made a gesture with his hand, touched the poet's cheek with his ring, and Dandelion felt sensation return to his jaw, tongue, and palate. Now, Ryans continued quietly, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you're going to answer them quickly, fluently, and comprehensively. And if you stammer or hesitate even for a moment, if you give me the slightest reason to doubt the truth of your words, then look down. Dandelion obeyed. He discovered to his horror that a short rope had been tied to the knots around his ankles, with a bucket full of lime attached to the other end. If I have you pulled any higher, Ryans smiled cruelly, and this bucket lifts with you, then you will probably never regain the feeling in your hands. After that, I doubt you'll be capable of playing anything on a lute. I really doubt it. So, I think you'll talk to me. Am I right? Dandelion didn't agree, because he couldn't move his head or find his voice out of sheer fright. But Riles did not seem to require confirmation. It is to be understood, he stated, that I will know immediately if you are telling the truth. If you try to trick me, I will realise straight away, and I won't be fooled by any poetic ploys or vague erudition. This is a trifle for me, just as paralysing you on the stairs was a trifle. So I advise you to weigh each word with care, you piece of scum. So, let's get on with it and stop wasting time. As you know, I'm interested in the heroine of one of your beautiful ballads, Queen Calanthe of Sintra's granddaughter. Princess Cyrilla, endearingly known as Ciri. 
According to eyewitnesses, this little person died during the siege of the town two years ago. Whereas in your ballad you so vividly and touchingly described her meeting a strange, almost legendary individual, the Witcher, Geralt, or Geralt. Leaving the poetic drivel about destiny and the decrees of fate aside from the rest of the ballad, it seems the child survived the Battle of Sintra in one piece. Is that true? I, I don't know, moaned Dandelion. By all the gods, I'm only a poet. I I've heard this and that. And the rest? Well, the rest I invented. Made it up. I don't know anything. The bard howled on seeing Ryons give a sign to the reeking man and feeling the rope tighten. I'm not lying! True, Ryons nodded. You're not lying outright. I would have sensed it. But you are beating about the bush. You wouldn't have thought the ballad up just like that, not without reason. And you do know the Witcher, after all. You have often been seen in his company. So tall, Dandelion, if you treasure your joints. Everything you know. This Siri, panted the poet, was destined for the Witcher. She's a so-called child surprise. You must have heard it. The story's well known. Her parents swore to hand her over to the Witcher. Her parents are supposed to have handed the child over to that crazed mutant. That murderous mercenary. You're lying, Rhymester. Keep such tales for women. That's what happened. I swear on my mother's soul, sobbed Dandelion. I have it from a reliable source. The Witcher. Talk about the girl. For the moment, I'm not interested in the Witcher. I don't know anything about the girl. I only know that the Witcher was going to fetch her from Sintra when the war broke out. I met him at the time. He heard about the massacre, about Galanthe's death from me. He asked me about the child, the Queen's granddaughter. But I knew everyone in Sintra was killed. Not a single soul in the last bastion survived. Go on. Fewer metaphors, more hard facts. When the Witcher learned of the massacre and fall of Sintra, he forsook his journey. We both escaped north. We parted ways in Hengfors, and I haven't seen him since. But because he talked on the way a bit about this... Siri, or whatever her name is, and about destiny. Well, I made up this ballad. I, I don't know any more, I swear. Ryons scowled at him. And where is this witcher now? he asked. This hired monster murderer, this poetic butcher who likes to discuss destiny. I told you, the last time I saw him, I know what you said. Ryons interrupted. I listened carefully to what you said, and now you're going to listen carefully to me. Answer my questions precisely. The question is, if no one has seen Geralt or Gerald, the Witcher, for over a year, where is he hiding? Where does he usually hide? I, I don't know where it is, the troubadour said quickly. I'm not lying. I really don't know. Too quick, Dandelion. Too quick. Ryons smiled ominously. Too eager. You are cunning, but not careful enough. You don't know where it is, you say. But I warrant you know what it is. Dandelion clenched his teeth with anger and despair. Well? Ryons made a sign to the reeking man. Where is the witcher hiding? What is the place called? The poet remained silent. The rope tightened, twisting his hands painfully, and his feet left the ground. Dandelion let out a howl, brief and broken, because Ryance's wizardly ring immediately gagged him. Higher! Higher! Ryance rested his hands on his hips. You know, Dandelion, I could use magic to sound out your mind, but it's exhausting. Besides, I like seeing people's eyes pop out of their sockets from pain. And you're going to tell me anyway. Dandelion knew he would. The rope, secured to his ankles, grew taut. The bucket of lime scraped along the ground. Sir, said the first ruffian suddenly, covering the lantern with his cloak and peering through the gap in the pigsty door. Someone's coming. Alas, I think. You know what to do, Ryons hissed. Put the lantern out. The reeking man released the rope, and Dandelion tumbled inertly to the ground, falling in such a way that he could see the man with the lantern standing at the door and the reeking man 
a long knife in his hand, lying in wait on the other side. Light broke in from the boardy house through gaps in the planks, and the poet heard the singing and hubbub. The door to the pigsty creaked open, revealing a short figure wrapped in a cloak and wearing a round, tightly fitting cap. After a moment's hesitation, the woman crossed the threshold. The reeking man threw himself at her, slashing forcefully with his knife, and tumbled to his knees as the knife met with no resistance, passing through the figure's throat as though through a cloud of smoke. Because the figure really was a cloud of smoke, one which was already starting to disperse. But before it completely vanished, another figure burst into the pigsty, indistinct, dark, and nimble as a weasel. Dandelion saw it throw a cloak at the lantern man, jump over the reeking one, saw something glisten in its hand, and heard the reeking man wheeze and choke savagely. The lantern man disentangled himself from the cloak, jumped, took a swing with his knife. A fiery lightning bolt shot from the dark figure with a hiss, slapped over the tough's face and chest with a crack, and spread over him like flaming oil. The ruffian screamed piercingly, and the grim reek of burning meat filled the pigsty. Then Ryance attacked. The spell he cast illuminated the darkness with a bluish flash, in which Dandelion saw a slender woman wearing man's clothes, gesticulating strangely with both hands. He only glimpsed her for a second, before the blue glow disappeared with a bang and a blinding flash. Ryance fell back with a roar of fury, and collapsed onto the wooden pigsty walls, breaking them with a crash. The woman, dressed in man's clothing, leapt after him, a stiletto flashing in her hand. The pigsty filled with brightness again, this time golden, beaming from a bright oval which suddenly appeared in the air. Dandelion saw Ryance spring up from the dusty floor, leap into the oval, and immediately disappear. The oval dimmed, but before it went out entirely, the woman ran up to it, shouting incomprehensibly, stretching out her hand. Something crackled and rustled, and the dying oval boiled with roaring flames for a moment. A muffled sound, as if coming from a great distance, reached Dandelion's ears, a sound very much like a scream of pain. The oval went out completely, and darkness engulfed the pigsty again. The poet felt the power which gagged him disappear. Help! he howled. Help! Stop yelling, Dandelion, said the woman, kneeling next to him, and slicing through the knots with Ryance's stiletto. Yennefer? Is that you? Surely you're not going to say you don't remember how I look, and I'm sure my voice is not unfamiliar to your musical ear. Can you get up? They didn't break any bones, did they? Dandelion stood with difficulty, groaned and stretched his aching shoulders. What's with them? He indicated the bodies lying on the ground. We'll check. The Enchantress snicked the stiletto shut. One of them should still be alive. I have a few questions for him. This one, the troubadour stood over the reeking man, probably still lives. I doubt it, said Yennefer indifferently. I severed his windpipe and carotid artery. There might still be a little murmur in him, but not for long. Dandelion shuddered. You slashed his throat. If, out of inborn caution, I hadn't sent an illusion in first, I would be the one lying there now. Let's look at the other one. Bloody hell! Such a sturdy fellow, and he still couldn't take it. Pity, pity. He's dead too. He couldn't take the shock. Hmm. I fried him a little too hard. See, even his teeth are charred. What's the matter with you, Dandelion? Are you going to be sick? I am the poet replied indistinctly, bending over and leaning his forehead against the pigsty wall. That's everything? The enchantress put her tumbler down and reached for the skewer of roast chickens. You haven't lied about anything, haven't forgotten anything. Nothing, apart from thank you. Thank you, Yennefer. She looked him in the eyes and nodded her head lightly making her glistening black curls writhe and cascade down to her shoulders. She slipped the roast chicken onto a trencher and began dividing it skillfully. She used a knife and fork. Dandelion had only known one person up until then who could eat a chicken with a knife and fork as skillfully. Now he knew how and from whom Geralt had learnt the knack. Well, he thought, no wonder. After all, he did live with her for a year in Wengerberg, and before he left her she had instilled a number of strange things into him. He pulled the other chicken from the skewer, and, without a second thought, ripped off a thigh and began eating it, pointedly holding it with both hands. "'How did you know?' he asked. "'How did you arrive with help on time?' "'I was beneath Blair Veris during your performance. I didn't see you. I didn't want to be seen.' 
Then I followed you into town. I waited here in the tavern. It wasn't fitting, after all, for me to follow you into that haven of dubious delight and certain gonorrhea. But I eventually became impatient and was wandering around the yard when I thought I heard voices coming from the pigsty. I sharpened my hearing, and it turned out it wasn't, as I'd first thought, some sodomite, but you. Hey, innkeeper, more wine, if you please. Uh, you're come old, honoured lady. Quick as a flash. The same as before, please, but this time without the water. I can only tolerate water in a bath. In wine, I find it quite loathsome. Uh, at your service. Uh, at your service. Yennefer pushed her plate aside. There was still enough meat on the chicken, Dandelion noticed, to feed the innkeeper and his family for breakfast. A knife and fork were certainly elegant and refined, but they weren't very effective. Thank you, he repeated, for rescuing me. That cursed Ryons wouldn't have spared my life. He'd have squeezed everything from me and then butchered me like a sheep. Yes, I think he would. She poured herself in the bard some wine, then raised her tumbler. So, let's drink to your rescue and health, Dandelion. And to yours, Yennefer, he toasted her in return. To health, for which, as of today, I shall pray whenever the occasion arises. I'm indebted to you, beautiful lady, and I shall repay the debt in my songs. I shall explode the myth which claims wizards are insensitive to the pain of others, that they are rarely eager to help poor, unfortunate, unfamiliar mortals. What to do? She smiled, half shutting her beautiful violet eyes. The myth has some justification. It did not spring from nowhere. But you're not a stranger, Dandelion. I know you, and like you. Really? The poet smiled too. You've been good at concealing it up until now. I've even heard the rumour that you can't stand me. I quote, any more than the plague. It was the case once. The enchantress suddenly grew serious. Later my opinion changed. Later I was grateful to you. What for, if I may ask? Never mind, she said, toying with the empty tumbler. Let us get back to more important questions. Those you were asked in the pigsty while your arms were being twisted out of their sockets. What really happened, Dandelion? Have you really not seen Geralt since you fled the banks of the Yaruga? Did you really not know he returned south after the war? That he was seriously wounded? So seriously, there were even rumours of his death? Didn't you know anything? No, I didn't. I stayed in Pont Varnes for a long time, in Esterad Thyssen's court, and then at Niedermere's in Hengfors. You didn't know? The Enchantress nodded and unfastened her tunic. A black velvet ribbon wound around her neck, an obsidian star set with diamonds hanging from it. You didn't know that when his wounds healed, Geralt went to Trance River? You can't guess who he was looking for? That I can, but I don't know if he found her. You don't know, she repeated. You, who usually know everything, and then sing about everything, even such intimate matters as someone else's feelings? I listened to your ballads beneath Bleoveris, Dandelion. He dedicated a good few verses to me. Poetry, he muttered, staring at the chicken, has its rights. No one should be offended. Hair like a raven's wing, as a storm in the night, quoted Yennefer with exaggerated emphasis. And in the violet eyes sleep lightning bolts. Isn't that how it went? That's how I remembered you. The poet smiled faintly. May the first who wishes to claim the description is untrue throw the first stone. Only I don't know. The enchantress pinched her lips together. Who gave you permission to describe my internal organs? How did it go? Her heart, as though a jewel, adorned her neck? Hard as if of diamond made, and as a diamond so unfeeling. Sharper than obsidian cutting. Did you make that up yourself? Or perhaps... Her lips quivered, twisted. Or perhaps you listened to someone's confidences and grievances. Hmm. Dandelion cleared his throat and veered away from the dangerous subject. Tell me, Yennefer, when did you last see Geralt? A long time ago. After the war? After the war. Yennefer's voice changed a little. No. I never saw him after the war. For a long time. I didn't see anybody. Well, back to the point, poet. 
I am a little surprised to discover that you do not know anything, you have not heard anything, and that in spite of this, someone searching for information picked you out to stretch over a beam. Doesn't that worry you? It does. Listen to me, she said sharply, banging her tumbler against the table. Listen carefully. Strike that ballad from your repertoire. Do not sing it again. Are you talking about... You know perfectly well what I'm talking about. Sing about the war against Nilfgaard. Sing about Geralt and me. You'll neither harm nor help anyone in the process. You'll make nothing any better or worse. But do not sing about the lion cub of Sintra. She glanced around to check if any of the few customers at this hour were eavesdropping, and waited until the last clearing up had returned to the kitchen. And do try to avoid one-to-one -one meetings with people you don't know, she said quietly. People who forget to introduce themselves by conveying greetings from a mutual acquaintance. Understand? He looked at her, surprised. Yennefer smiled. Greetings from Dykstra, Dandelion. Now the bard glanced around timidly. His astonishment must have been evident, and his expression amusing, because the sorceress allowed herself a quite derisive grimace. While we are on the subject, she whispered, leaning across the table, Dykstra is asking for a report. You're on your way back from Verden, and he's interested in hearing what's being said at King Erviel's court. He asked me to convey that this time your report should be to the point, detailed, and under no circumstances in verse. Prose, Dandelion. Prose. The poet swallowed and nodded. He remained silent, pondering the question. But the Enchantress anticipated him. Difficult times are approaching, she said quietly. Difficult and dangerous. A time of change is coming. It would be a shame to grow old with the uncomfortable conviction that one had done nothing to ensure that these changes are for the better. Don't you agree? He agreed with a nod and cleared his throat. Yennefer, I'm listening, Pert. Those men in the pigsty... I would like to know who they were, what they wanted, who sent them. You killed them both. But rumour has it that you can draw information even from the dead. And doesn't rumour also have it that necromancy is forbidden by edict of the chapter? Let it go, Dandelion. Those thugs probably didn't know much anyway. The one who escaped? Hmm, he's another matter. Ryons? He was a wizard, wasn't he? Yes, but not a very proficient one. Yet he managed to escape from you. I saw how he did it. He teleported, didn't he? Doesn't that prove anything? Indeed it does. That someone helped him. Ryance had neither the time nor the strength to open an oval portal suspended in the air. A portal like that is no joke. It's clear that someone else opened it. Someone far more powerful. That's why I was afraid to chase him, not knowing where I would land. But I sent some pretty hot stuff after him. He's going to need a lot of spells and some effective burn elixirs, and will remain marked for some time. Maybe you will be interested to hear that he was a Nilfgaardian. You think so? Yennefer sat up, and with a swift movement pulled the stiletto from her pocket, and turned it in her palm. A lot of people carry Nilfgaardian knives now. They're comfortable and handy. They can even be hidden in a cleavage. It's not the knife. When he was questioning me, he used the term battle for Sintra, conquest of the town, or something along those lines. I've never heard anyone describe those events like that. For us, it has always been a massacre, the massacre of Sintra. No one refers to it by any other name. The magician raised her hand, scrutinised her nails. Clever, Dandelion. You have a sensitive ear. It's a professional hazard. I wonder which profession you have in mind. She smiled coquettishly. But thank you for the information. It was valuable. Let it be, he replied with a smile, my contribution to making changes for the better. Tell me, Yennefer, why is Nilfgaard so interested in Geralt and the girl from Sintra? Don't stick your nose into that business. She suddenly turned serious. I said you were to forget you ever heard of Calanthe's granddaughter. Indeed you did. But I'm not searching for a subject for a ballad. What the hell are you searching for, then? Trouble? Let's take it, he said quietly, resting his chin on his clasped hands and looking the enchantress in the eye. Let's take it that 
Geralt did, in fact, find and rescue the child. Let's take it that he finally came to believe in the power of destiny, and took the child with him. Where to? Ryons tried to force it out of me with torture. But you know, Yennefer, you know where the Witcher is hiding. I do. And you know how to get there. I know that too. Don't you think he should be warned? Warned that the likes of Ryons are looking for him, and the little girl. I would go, but I honestly don't know where it is. That place whose name I prefer not to say. Get to the point, Dandelion. If you know where Geralt is, you ought to go and warn him. You owe him that, Yennefer. There was, after all, something between you. Yes, she acknowledged coldly. There was something between us. That's why I know him a bit. He does not like having help imposed on him, and if he was in need of it, he would seek it from those he could trust. A year has gone by since those events, and I... I've not had any news from him, and as for our debt... I owe him exactly as much as he owes me, no more and no less. So I'll go then. He raised his head high. Tell me, I won't, she interrupted. Your cover's blown, Dandelion. They might come after you again. The less you know, the better. Banish from here. Go to Redania, to Dykstra and Philippa Eilhart. Stick to Vizimir's court. And I warn you once more, forget the lion cub of Sintra. Forget about Siri. Pretend you have never heard the name. Do as I ask. I wouldn't like anything bad to happen to you. I like you too much. Owe you too much. You've said that already. What do you owe me, Yennefer? The sorceress turned her head away, did not say anything for a while. You travelled with him, she said finally. Thanks to you, he was not alone. You were a friend to him. You were with him. The bard lowered his eyes. He didn't get much from it, he muttered. He didn't get much from our friendship. He had little but trouble because of me. He constantly had to get me out of some scrape. Help me. She leaned across the table, put her hand on his and squeezed it, hard, without saying anything. Her eyes held regret. Go to Redania she repeated after a moment, to traitor gore. Stay in Dykstra's and Philippa's care. Don't play at being a hero. You have got yourself mixed up in a dangerous affair, Dandelion. I've noticed. He grimaced and rubbed his aching shoulder. And that is precisely why I believe Geralt should be warned. You are the only one who knows where to look for him. You know the way. I guess you used to be... a guest there? Yennefer turned away. Dandelion saw her lips pinch, the muscles in her cheek quiver. Yes, in the past, she said, and there was something elusive and strange in her voice. I used to be a guest there, sometimes, but never uninvited. The wind howled savagely rippling through the grasses growing over the ruins, rustling in the hawthorn bushes and tall nettles. Clouds sped across the sphere of the moon, momentarily illuminating the great castle, drenching the moat and few remaining walls in a pale glow, undulating with shadows, and revealing mounds of skulls, baring their broken teeth, and staring into nothingness through the black holes of their eye sockets. Ciri squealed sharply and hid her face in the witch's cloak. The mare prodded on by the witch's heels carefully stepped over a pile of bricks and passed through the broken arcade. Her horseshoes, ringing against the flagstones, awoke weird echoes between the walls, muffled by the howling gale. Ciri trembled, digging her hands into the horse's mane. I'm frightened, she whispered. There's nothing to be frightened of, replied the witcher, laying his hand on her shoulder. It's hard to find a safer place in the whole world. This is Kea Moren. The witches keep. There used to be a beautiful castle here, a long time ago. She did not reply, bowing her head low. The witch's mare, called Roach, snorted quietly, as if she too wanted to reassure the girl. They immersed themselves in a dark abyss, in a long, unending black tunnel, 
dotted with columns and arcades. Roach stepped confidently and willingly, ignoring the impenetrable darkness, and her horseshoes rang brightly against the floor. In front of them, at the end of the tunnel, a straight, vertical line suddenly flared with a red light. Growing taller and wider, it became a door beyond which was a faint glow, the flickering brightness of torches stuck in iron mounts on the walls. A black figure stood framed in the door, blurred by the brightness. Who comes? Siri heard a menacing, metallic voice, which sounded like a dog's bark. Geralt? Yes, Eskel. It's me. Come in. The witcher dismounted, took Siri from the saddle, stood her on the ground, and pressed a bundle into her little hands, which she grabbed tightly, only regretting that it was too small for her to hide behind completely. Wait here with Eskel, he said. I'll take Rolch to the stables. Come into the light, laddie, growled the man called Eskel. Don't lurk in the dark. Siri looked up into his face and barely restrained her frightened scream. He wasn't human. Although he stood on two legs, although he smelled of sweat and smoke, although he wore ordinary human clothes, he was not human. No human can have a face like that, she thought. Well, what are you waiting for? repeated Eskel. She didn't move. In the darkness, she heard the clatter of Roach's horseshoes grow fainter. Something soft and squeaking ran over her foot. She jumped. Don't loiter in the dark, or the rats will eat your boots. Still clinging to her bundle, Siri moved briskly towards the light. The rats bolted out from beneath her feet with a squeak. Eskil leaned over, took the package from her, and pulled back her hood. A plague on it, he muttered. A girl. That's all we need. She glanced at him, frightened. Eskil was smiling. She saw that he was human after all, that he had an entirely human face, deformed by a long, ugly, semicircular scar running from the corner of his mouth, across the length of his cheek, up to the ear. "'Since you're here, welcome to Kea Morin, he said. "'What do they call you?' "'Siri,' Geralt replied for her, silently emerging from the darkness. Eskel turned around. Suddenly, quickly, wordlessly, the witchers fell into each other's arms and wound their shoulders around each other tight and hard for one brief moment. "'Wolf, you're alive.' "'I am.' All right. Eskel took a torch from his bracket. Come on. I'm closing the inner gates to stop the heat escaping. They walked along the corridor. There were rats here, too. They flitted under the walls, squeaked from the dark abyss, from the branching passages, and skittered before the swaying circle of light thrown by the torch. Siri walked quickly, trying to keep up with the men. Who's wintering here, Eskel, apart from Vesemir? Lambert and Cohen. They descended a steep and slippery flight of stairs. A gleam was visible below them. Siri heard voices, detected the smell of smoke. The hall was enormous, and flooded with light from a huge hearth roaring with flames, which were being sucked up into the heart of the chimney. The centre of the hall was taken up by an enormous heavy table. At least ten people could sit around that table. There were three. Three humans. Three witches, Siri corrected herself. She saw nothing but their silhouettes against the fire in the hearth. Greetings, Wolf. We've been waiting for you. Greetings, Vesemir. Greetings, lad. It's good to be home again. Who have you brought us? Geralt was silent for a moment. Then he put his hand on Ciri's shoulder and lightly pushed her forward. She walked awkwardly, hesitantly, huddled up and hunched, her head lowered. I'm frightened, she thought. I'm very frightened. When Geralt found me, when he took me with him, I thought the fear wouldn't come back. I thought it had passed. And now, instead of being at home, I'm in this terrible, dark, ruined old castle full of rats and dreadful echoes. I'm standing in front of a red wall of fire again. I see sinister black figures. I see dreadful, menacing, glistening eyes staring at me. Who is this child, Wolf? Who is this girl? She's my... Geralt suddenly stammered. She felt his strong, hard hands on her shoulders. And suddenly, the fear disappeared, vanished without a trace. The roaring red fire gave out warmth, only warmth, 
The black silhouettes were the silhouettes of friends, carers. Their glistening eyes expressed curiosity, concern, and unease. Geralt's hands clenched over her shoulders. She's our destiny.